Dungeons and Dragons YouTube channel posted the new wizard outline uh, just under two weeks ago as of this recording. And I haven't watched this yet. So far, we've gone over the Warlock and the Paladin, and I personally am kind of mixed on how I feel about the um, class updates. I know there's a handful of people that really didn't like what I had to say about Paladins, and so because of that, I feel the need to remind everyone that um, these are just my opinions based off of my 12 plus years as a DM. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into the wizard. Hello everyone, today we are talking about the wizard. The wizard has all sorts of new magical goodies, some in the class, but many of them in the spell chapter. The wizard is the paramount collector of spells in D&D. They have the longest spell list of any class, and that list in the new player's handbook got even longer, which we were able to do partly because the spell chapter got even bigger, and many of those spells are for the wizard because spell access and spell versatility is the beating heart of the wizard class. All right, right off the bat, loving it. Uh, he's absolutely right. Wizards are super versatile when it comes to magic, and so they have always historically had the largest spell list if the spell chapter is getting longer it's only natural that the wizards get more spells um hopefully the majority of the spells that they bring in are good spells not you know useless spells like i don't know um find traps is kind of useless um true strike is mostly useless um you know stuff like that I'm sure there will be some real lemons in the list. There's, there's got to be. There always is. But the fact that they're bringing in more to give the wizard more versatility is, in my opinion, fantastic. And so, whereas other spellcasting classes, of course, also care about spells, but often their spellcasting is enhanced by a number of other features that they have that bring their distinctiveness whereas the wizard's primary distinctiveness is a huge variety of spells at their fingertips. And so we just leaned into that even more, just as in every class, we've leaned into what really makes a particular class shine, what makes it really exciting to the people who love playing that class. And so with the wizard, it is give us all the spells so much has changed with spells as well. There have been, I mean, there's there's a lot of quality of life improvements in so many of these spells. The wizard is consequently the most affected by that. Exactly. And then the wizard has a number of new features and enhanced features that allow them to interact with that massive treasure chest of spells in the book uh, with even greater versatility. So for example, at first level, Wizards now have the ability to change one of their cantrips every time they finish a long rest. No other class has this capability. That's, that's great. Um, it's a little wonky because, I mean, it's just cantrips, but the ability to change cantrips, usually that's something that, uh, you know, you're stuck with. Once you pick them, your cantrips are stuck with. Um, but to be able to take a long rest and then change your cantrips, say... If for whatever reason you decide, you know, your DM decides to run you through Curse of Strahd and you don't have any cantrips for, that would be situationally better if you're going against Undead, you take a long rest and switch out those cam cantrips. Um, you can, I think it's great that they can now swap out cantrips after a long rest because it just adds to their versatility. And that's something that Wizards absolutely needs, uh, especially since they are notorious for not having any health, not being able to take a hit. They are glass cannons. So increasing their versatility with magic is, um, in my opinion, great. Not necessarily needed because they were already incredibly versatile, but adding versatility is a very good thing 
mostly because they are glass can cans historically. So I like the idea of this. Um, I can already see some of my players figuring out a way to abuse it, but I'm okay with that. Uh, to just every day be, no, I now know a different cantrip. I changed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, that's a great example of how we're leaning into that, that breadth and versatility that is such a distinctive aspect of the wizard and always has been uh, as one of the classes that has been in the game the longest. Uh, we have also, uh, at first level, added a, a, another new, f well, a new feature called Ritual Adept. Now, functionally, this feature is not new. Uh, what this feature does is it allows the wizard to cast as a ritual any ritual that is in the wizard's spellbook. I say it's not functionally a new feature because wizards in 2014 had that capability. We decided though to take that capability which used to be inside the spellcasting feature and we broke it out into its own class feature because we realized that there were a number of wizard players who were missing the fact that they had that feature because the spellcasting feature has a lot going on in it and it's, it can actually be easy to miss this little section about, oh, and hey, by the way, you're really great at using rituals. And we thought that was an important enough part of the wizard's identity and really a separate bit of functionality from the base spellcasting feature that we broke it out into its own feature called, again, Ritual Adept. Yeah, no, he's he's absolutely right. Um, in in my twelve plus years as a DM, I very rarely see my wizard players thinking about ritual casting. Um, sometimes you have to nudge them along and remind them that they have that ability. And I think it's great that they're making it a class feature so that it's front and center. Um, so this class that's focused on casting has different ways to cast spells, cast more spells um, that a lot of people missed and forgot about because, like he said. Spellcasting in the player's handbook is is <laughs> it has a lot going on. It can be confusing. I know every time I have a new player, we have to sit down and and pretty much have a small class on it, and uh, so they're really simplifying that with this, making this a class feature. So it'll help new players play wizards, uh, which I ordinarily wouldn't recommend a wizard to a new player. Uh, this will make it easier for them, and that is, in my opinion, fantastic. Perfect. At second level, uh, gave a truly new feature to the wizard uh, called Scholar. And here, just as we have in several of our other classes where we've given people a bit more versatility outside combat, now, not that the wizard needed a whole lot of help in that realm, because wizards, as a result of having so much spell versatility, yeah. have access to a lot of non-combat spells. Yeah. But we also, with the wizard, wanted to do a better job of, in the game mechanics, highlighting that wizards are meant to be the consummate scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, that a huge part of our, their identity is that they are bookish folk. And so the new scholar ability allows the wizard to select a, a skill from a list in the feature and have expertise in that skill. And the skills on the list are like arcana, history, uh, et cetera. All, all skills that are about being uh, an expert in essentially an academic field. I like the idea of this because in in my personal experience um skills like arcana and history and religion they tend to be tossed by the wayside any of those intelligence based skill checks tend to be forgotten about by my players they don't they forget that they have the skills so they don't try and do those kinds of checks um so for for wizards to now get expertise in them especially at second level uh, that's <laughs> I think it'll it'll bring a, a a breath of fresh air to role playing or different types of investigations if they're trying to find something or figure something out in a magical or historical or even religious nature and I love that they're making it a a class feature um, at least for the wizard 
so that hopefully these skills that have otherwise not been used as often uh, will be used more frequently. People will remember them more and it'll make people want to role play more or get into the role playing aspect of the game more. Because most players are either afraid to get into role playing or afraid of like looking goofy when doing it. Um, and that's 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 fair. I look goofy all the time when I'm role playing. It's it's great. It's good fun. So I'm very very happy to see this this class feature. And we have often in the story text for the wizard talked about that aspect of wizards. We wanted to give the story some teeth in the rules, and hence the creation of the scholar that feature. Great. Now, the wizard gets yet another brand new feature at fifth level, and this feature is called Memorize Spell. And again, leaning into the versatility of wizards, we gave them a bit more versatility. Memorize Spell now allows the wizard, when they finish a short rest, to swap out one of the level one or higher spells they have prepared for another one in their spell book. You know, if they, if they know they have that one spell in their spell book that they really wish they had prepared, Memorize Spell will now allow them to do that. And that's huge for any type of combat, like potential combat encounter, but it's, or you are running into like a, something that's happening in a dungeon and you need to find a way to like get through this situation. That's perfect. That's what the wizard should be good at. Yes, exactly. Otherwise, the the wizard in its bones is largely what people sort of know and love. Uh, we've made some tweaks in how we present some of the material in the wizard, but really the heart of the new material in the base class is even greater breadth uh, and greater versatility. And then that that sets up the four subclasses to be very well equipped to then do what they're great at, having such a firm, versatile base uh, for their features to be built on. So one of the very first subclasses is the Abjurer. Tell me about this. This is, this is the one that is a lot about defensive magic. Yes, the Abjurer is at heart all about defending themselves and then ultimately also being able to defend others and to aid them in their defensive capabilities, we've done a number of things, both in the subclass itself, but also in the wizard's spell list. There are a number of spells that were previously not abjurations that now are. Oh, interesting. And we did this, uh, A, because some of the spells we felt had been misclassified as other types of magic, and so we, we were correcting them, the spells themselves, making them abjurations. But this is also of practical importance to the abjurer because it's casting abjuration spells that helps refresh their magical force field that absorbs damage. Yeah. And so that's another example of how the work that we've done in the spell chapter and in the wizard spell list has a powerful effect on how this subclass functions as well as the other wizard subclasses. Absolutely. Each of the four wizard subclasses now has a brand new version of their savant feature. That feature used to give the wizard a discount on scribing scr spells of that school into their spell book. Right. We found over the last decade that in actual play, this was rarely actually being used. Often people would forget they had it. Yeah. And even if they remembered they had it, it wasn't, it was not actually doing them a whole lot of good. So we wanted to give people something more concrete that not only would they enjoy, but also really help ensure that they were connected to their favorite school of magic. So uh, in the abjurer, abjuration savant, uh, right away gives you uh, two more abjuration spells uh, that you get to add to your spell book for free. Okay. And then 
every time you level up thereafter as a wizard, you get an additional abjuration spell for free. And so we've taken this shtick, and that shtick is now in all four of the wizard subclasses, ensuring that if you're an abjurer, evoker, illusionist, or diviner, you are going. You are guaranteed yeah. every time you level up to get at least one spell that is associated with your favorite school of magic. Okay, perfect. Uh, so that that makes that feature in all four of the subclasses far more useful, uh, and again, does some important work in making sure that you are actually connected to your favored school. Now, in the Abjurer's Arcane Ward, which is really their signature class feature, yeah. you know, this is the feature where they get to conjure up a, a f protective field of magic, and it can essentially take their damage for them. Yeah. We made uh, what, uh, if a person's reading fast, they might, they might miss it when they get to the feature, but we made a significant change to how the arcane ward works. And that is, if, if your abjurer has resistance, vulnerability, oh, or yes. immunity, yeah. those are now all applied before the arcane ward takes damage. And now, you'll be sad in the rare case of you having vulnerability and it being applied <laughs> first. But most of the time, yeah. what this is going to mean is this, if you have acquired resistance to a particular damage type, it now means your arcane ward uh, can benefit from that resistance. Absolutely. Uh, and we then also applied that improvement to the projected ward feature that you get later, where you then have the ability to share your protection with friends. Um, but in that case, rather than it being your resistance or vulnerability or immunity that's applied, it's theirs. Uh, so uh, if, let's say, you're protecting uh, your friend who has poison resistance and they take poison damage, their resistance to poison damage will kick in first, then the arcane ward will take the remaining damage. And then if there's still damage left over, then it, only then will it reach the person who's being protected. The, the benefit of this is if you have an abjur abjuration spell that can give you resistances like that, mm -hmm. and you cast it, you are not only funneling energy yes. into your shield, essentially, yeah. but you are also applying those resistances that that spell would have to that damage at the same time. You're just you're kind of gaming the system constantly. You're, you're, you're growing your shield and then making it more resistant at the same time, all in one. Before you get to uh, your level 14 feature, you actually get a brand new feature as an abjurer called Spellbreaker. At level 10, yeah. Spellbreaker now makes it so that you always have uh, the counter spell and dispel magic spells prepared and you can cast Dispel Magic as a bonus action. Uh, and when you cast either of the spells with the spell slot, uh, if the spell fails to either counter another spell or dispel a spell, your spell slot is not expended. This is the wizard who not only is, you know, another spellcaster does not want to get into a, a spell duel with the Abjurer, uh, but also Dispel Magic being a bonus action means if you're in one of those situations in the game where, you know, sometimes there'll be a battle where there's a MacGuffin with some kind of magical protection and most other characters would have to use their entire action to try to yeah. break that protection on it. The Abjurer can just walk up as a bonus action, try to shatter the spell and still take their action to do something else. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so Spellbreaker uh, is a really exciting new feature for this subclass. And then uh, at level 14, uh, the Abjurer still gets their spell resistance that they had before. That's very fun. Again, you're like honing in on what makes the Abjurer, that, that wish fulfillment, that fantasy that you would have concrete. Absolutely. We then had a similar approach with the Diviner. Right. So... I love the changes they made to the Abjurer, uh, especially Spellbreaker. Um, for for the spell magic to be able to use as a bonus action is is great. Um, 
And just always have counter spell and spell magic prepared. Just hey, as a base, like you don't have to make it one of your prepared spells. That is huge. That means that gives you more versatility, automatic versatility. Um <laughs> and then all the, the resistances and the immunities being automatically applied to your shield, your your ward to give you that little added oomph to stay alive and then your abjuration spells renewing that um i love that they're trying to make the wizard more survivable and uh i think they did a really good job with the with the abjurer there um I'm looking forward to seeing it in in play to be honest with you because the diviner was in such fantastic shape yeah. in 2014 uh, a a very beloved subclass, a very effective subclass. Uh, so the main things that uh, people who love playing diviners uh, have to look forward to is the improved divination savant, which uh, like the savant spells right. and the other subclasses, make sure that you always get some divination spells as you level up as a wizard when you get up to level 10 and get the third eye ability uh, that you can now use this as a bonus action rather than an action and we did this because we wanted you to be able to unlock the cool senses that this feature gives you even in the midst of a battle and not lose your whole turn doing it we also uh, fine-tuned and upgraded the options within the third eye. So the dark vision option, for, for instance, now extends to 120 feet. We did this partly because we now have some of the species in the book uh, who have dark vision of 120 feet. Uh, we also uh, combined some of the abilities that were present before under the third eye into one called simply now see invisibility which allows you now to cast the see invisibility spell without expending a spell slot uh, so some some nice quality of life improvements uh, particularly in that third eye feature that you get at level 10. in the play test for this for all of this does combat feel significantly faster? It just feels like there's a new momentum because so many things are being shifted to a bonus action. Like it feel, it just feels like things are going to be moving so much quicker in D and D now. So it it varies depending on what characters do, um, and also some things that used to be bonus actions right. are now actions, or are now a part of some other action. Right. So it it really is. It been a just a large holistic shuffling of things to try to get them to be in the right part of the action economy to keep keep things moving but also to make it so that things feel like they are costing the right part of the action economy right uh, often we'll make the change because it, something as an action just wasn't pulling its weight. And so then we either beefed it up so that it did pull its weight as an action, or we turned it into a bonus action or a reaction or not an action at all. And it just became something that happens as part of another action or at the start or end of your turn. Okay. Uh, and so there are, there are tweaks like that that we made uh, within the wizard, uh, but through the entire game. Okay, perfect. So how about next we talk about the evoker if you love dealing da all right so before we get into the evoker they like they said they didn't change a whole lot in the, in the diviner class uh they they changed third eye uh which is cool uh see visibility is cool um for the most part it's it's the same class uh i'm confused as to why he said it, it was a beloved class i've I think I've seen somebody play it once, um, and they pretty much complained the rest of the campaign after picking it as their subclass, um, until they finally decided I'm in a multi-class and, and be done with this. I've used it in a couple of my NPCs here and there, and I can see some, I can see some kind of fun in it, um, 
but I don't, I personally haven't seen any real picks of that subclass. So I'm sure there's people out there that pick it and love it. Um, but the, yeah, the Diviner subclass isn't one I saw a whole lot of play from. So personally, um, but let me know if, if you've picked it or if, you know, player, you've seen a lot of players pick it. I'd love to be proven wrong on this one. Damage and also not destroying your entire party. This is the subclass for you. So what I'm terrified of what might have improved because it was already very strong. So, yeah, the the evoker and the diviner were two of the most solid subclasses in the 2014 Players Handbook, just in terms of delivering what they needed to deliver for their identity. Yeah. Uh, and so because of that, in each, in each of these subclasses, uh, our job was mostly don't mess anything up. Uh, and so in the evoker, they get their evocation savant uh, feature now. So again, like like the other wizard subclasses, they're going to get supplied by uh, evocation spells uh, throughout their career as a wizard. But then we did make a major enhancement in the potent cantrip feature. Uh, potent cantrip used to pertain only to saving throws and specifically saving throw cantrips. The issue is there were not a ton of those for evokers to use in the 2014 Player's Handbook, and even subsequent to that book, there were only a few. And right. so what we did is we've made it so that Potent Cantrip now applies not just to cantrips you cast that involve a saving throw, but also ones that involve an attack roll. And now, when you cast those at a creature and you miss or the creature succeeds on its saving throw, you still deal half damage to them. That's uh, amazing. This is really meant to point at the fact that the Evoker is in many ways the, the, the premier battle magician in the game and better than pretty much anyone can ensure that they're gonna deal a little bit of damage every time they take a turn if they're casting a damaging spell. And this happens sooner, doesn't it? Uh, this happens at level three when you get the subclass. Yeah. Now, the wizard subclasses, which used to kick in at level two, now all kick in at level three. Right. Again, because now all classes get their subclass at level three. Perfect. Otherwise, the, the evoker is the amazingly powerful and effective subclass that it always was. Over town, over town, over town. <laughs> <laughs> Sculpt spell. <laughs> yes. Yeah, with Sculpt Spell uh, continuing to be uh, a, a really pivotal part of the Evoker's kit, because if you have, if you have a, a subclass that's all about bringing the boom, it sure is nice if they're not blowing up their, their friends. Now, there are some significant changes to a subclass that I actually quite like. So the, the Evocation subclass, which is now the Evoker subclass, is the one that I saw the most play out of for my players. Um, <laughs> and like they said, it, it's the best at bringing in the damage for the wizards, and that's why so many players love playing it, is because you play a wizard to deal damage. Um, they didn't they didn't get this... Um, they didn't get famous for being a glass cannon for not being able to deal damage, you know? Um... We all know that the joke wizard died from 1d4 of whatever damage, you know, 1d4 breathing damage, whatever. They're glass cannon. They always have been. And it's because of the evocation subclass, because uh, they can just dole out massive amounts of damage. Um, but there's not really any class feature that helps their survivability other than, hey, I'm going to just do boatloads of damage. I'm going to kill whatever's attacking us before it can get to me. Um, that's that's their shtick. That's how they survive. And it's great. And I, I love seeing it. Um, <laughs> the the changes to the potent cantrip uh, just kind of make me giggle. It, it's great. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it.
love that are new and exciting, and that is for The Illusionist. Yes, The Illusionist, in addition to getting uh, their Illusion Savant feature at right. level three, then right away has in the subclass two new features. Uh, there's one of them is also at level three called Improved Illusions. And then at level six, they get a brand new feature called Phantasmal Creatures. Yeah. Following the Unearth Arcana series and getting feedback on the Illusionist and also in our own playtests of the Illusionist, we felt that this subclass needed more. And so one of our goals with these new features is to make it so that the Illusionist is actually the best subclass at casting illusions. And so the improved illusions feature that they now get at level three is all about that. Uh, first, they can now cast their illusion spells without providing verbal components. We did this because we wanted an illusionist, if they want to, to be able to create illusions silently. And in especially exploration and social situations in the game, this will be immensely helpful because now, you know, the, the spell might have a somatic component and so the illusionist might be twiddling their fingers but doesn't have to say anything yeah. aloud. And so they might be able to cause an illusion to suddenly appear in a situation and no one will know that it was that person over there Perfect. who did it. We've also made it in this same feature that any of the illusionist's uh, illusion spells that has a range of at least 10 feet now has that range increased by 60 feet. Oh, wow. And so that also now means that illusionists can create their illusions in a much larger range than other characters can. And be way more tactical about distractions and things like that. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, if someone else, you know, has to have the illusion just within, you know, 10 feet. Yeah. The illusionists can have their illusion 70 feet over there. Uh, and giving them much more flexibility in how they essentially mess with people uh, yeah. in a particular situation. And harder to tell from that distance that is an illusion, right? Like, yeah, just as a, if, I, if I was a dungeon master, like, if there was an illusion of someone, you know, 60 feet away, like, how good is your, you know, your visual acuity at that point for you to identify that that is fake? Yes. Yeah, significantly less. But Improved in Illusions has even more. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it, what it did before is it gave you the minor illusion cantrip. Right. So that also was included in the feature. That cantrip does not count against the number of cantrips that you know as a wizard. Uh, it Just like it did in 2014, this feature lets you create both a visual and an audible illusion simultaneously with minor illusion, and you can cast minor illusion as a bonus action. And then at level six, you get phantasmal creatures. Yeah, this is really amazing. And here, we wanted to give illusionists uh, an ability that had a bit more combat teeth and also really helped fulfill that fantasy of you know, I create an illusory bear and it yeah. roars and, and, and creates havoc. And in addition to creating a distraction, can actually fight in battle. And so what Phantasmal Creatures does is it gives the illusionist the summon beast and summon fae spells. The illusionist always now has these two spells prepared. And by the way, here's another great example of how we were able to lean on the expanded spell chapter of this book to enhance our classes and subclasses because Summon Beast and Summon Fey weren't in the 2014 Player's Handbook. They're new spells in the 2024 Player's Handbook. And so the Illusionist can now benefit from them. And the Illusionist now has the option of casting these two spells as normal, of conjuring up a, a beast uh, or a Fey creature. But the Illusionist also has the option of changing the school of magic on these two spells from conjuration to illusion. And if the illusionist does that, uh, you can cast the illusory version without expending a spell slot. But if you do that, the illusion has half as many hit points as the non-illusory version would have. Right. But what this basically but means... But you can still opt to do the full hit points if you want. Yes, you can. But what this means is 
uh, an illusionist can, once they reach level six, cast Summon Beast and Summon Fae, each of those spells, once per day without expending a spell slot, uh, as long as you uh, summon the illusory version of the beast or the fae. Right. Uh, so this is going to be a ton of fun, super useful, not only in combat, but even in exploration situations. If, say, you need one of these creatures to show up and, because it can fly, yeah. or, you know, go get that thing over there, or... Um, I mean, especially, hey, it's an illusion. Don't feel bad about it. Have, yeah, no, have I know. It, it go step <laughs> on that trap. <laughs> this is walking through the Tomb of Horrors one by one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this feature combined with improved illusions uh, is really going to bring the illusionist to life, I think, in a way we haven't seen in 5th edition. And you're using the stat blocks are in those summoning spells, but you can make it look like anything you want, really, because you're an illusionist, right? Like, that's the flavor of it. Because, yeah, you, you can, with these spells, flavor how they look. Yeah. Now then at level 10, you still get the illusory self feature, which is the illusionist's defensive ability. Uh, but a uh, really nice set of enhancements we've made to the feature is first we've made it so that it's triggered by you being hit by an attack rather than attack roll being simply made at you yeah so you won't even you won't even be tempted to use it until it's really necessary yeah. for you to use it and then the other thing we did is we made it so that if you want you can restore your use of this feature by expending a, a spell slot of level two or higher. That's huge. And at, especially at higher levels, wizards have a whole lot of spell slots. Yeah. And so the illusionists, if they want to, can farm their spell slots to get more uses of illusory self. That makes you a very defensible character. And so all of these changes combined mean in many ways the illusionist is a new subclass. Yeah. Uh, because Really, the only part of the subclass that is largely the same as it was before is its capstone ability at level 14, Illusory Reality. Which has always been amazing. Yeah, and that's we, we didn't want to touch that because it is such an iconic ability of yeah. the subclass of being able to, you know, and, and this is the example we give in the feature itself of create an illusory bridge with, you know, a spell that's able to create an illusion like that and then use this feature to say, nah, it's a real bridge. Yeah. Uh, and have and have you and your companions cross it and then oh maybe maybe <laughs> get f other people your foes to try to follow you and then oh whoops, it's back to being an illusion. I have up been up to a many shenanigans with that particular feature, both in villains and as a player. You know, uh, you if you wanted to be a really nasty villain, you could have an entire room that is just, there's a spiked pit below, and you create the illusion of a floor that is real, and then if things pop off, you just cause everything to fall. <laughs> yeah, there's a thousand uses for that. It's so it's so good. Yeah, and we also have more guidance about illusion magic as well. Correct? Yes. So in the rules glossary, there is now a section on illusions and that section addresses some of the more common questions that come up about illusions uh, like you know simple things like how are they affected by the environment around them but also as we reviewed all of the illusion spells in the book's massive spell chapter we made sure to add in clarifications anywhere we felt the spell could be clearer about how its illusion worked. Uh, but also, again, some of that clarity uh, isn't in those spells themselves, but in the new glossary entry on illusions. And that glossary, uh, which I know we'll talk about in more depth in another video, really is going to be everyone's buddy at the game table. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking about it now, not only because of the illusion section for illusionists, but also how much of that rules glossary will be useful to wizard players and players of other spell cast. So the, the illusionist subclass is another subclass that I've never really seen a whole lot of play out of. Um, it's got some funny, um, some neat gimmicks in it for the, the 2020, 
not 2024, the 2014 Player's Handbook. It's got some neat, fun gimmicks that, that are fun to exploit. Um, illusion reality is, or elusive reality is really cool on paper. I don't really see a whole lot of uh, illusionist subclass wizards hitting level 14, getting that, that feature. Um, the couple that I have had have abused the hell out of that, obviously, because it's really easy to abuse, as they said. Um, but the changes they've made to this subclass, I love. I think it'll really bring in more illusionist players. Uh, we won't just see an army of wizard evoker players. Um, I'm hoping that, that the abjurer and the illusionist see a lot more play. I hope that the, the diviner gets some more play because I've, like I said, I've seen next to none. Um, and I'm sure it will. I don't know how much, um, but I love the changes that they've made to the two subclasses that they made changes to. <laughs> the Diviner and the Evoker are still almost identical to what they were in the 2014. And with the Evoker, it's like, why fix what's not broken? And, you know, they're, they're right in this video. The Diviner has always been its identity. Like, it's... Is always done exactly what you would expect somebody with divination magic to to do. Um, I don't think that the changes they've made to it are really going to make it more or less playable than it already was. I think it's just people see it and read it and the description's just kind of bland and blasé and boring. And nobody really wants to, to do that because they don't see any fun in it. Um, hopefully I'm wrong. Uh, hopefully you guys can tell me that I'm wrong and that you've seen a lot of Diviner players or, or Illusionist players. Um, something other than just the Evoker players that I've seen. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm really looking forward to the to the Wizard in the 2024 Player's Handbook. Um, they're just talking about the Spell Glossary. I think it's about to pop into the pre-order. So, you know, do do what you gotta do. This is where we're going to stop this this video. Um, if you disliked anything I had to say, obviously say so in, in the comments below. I will always respond at my earliest convenience as, as soon as I can, really. Um, I, I do have a full-time job, so I can't always respond as soon as you guys comment. But I do respond as quickly as I can to y'all. So if, if you got an issue with anything I say, if you, if you have any questions, if you want me to cover a certain class... Um, or certain one of their videos or anything really just uh like i said say it in the comments below and i'll i'll get back to you as quickly as i can but thanks for watching